It's been nearly four weeks since Israel launched Operation Protective Edge against the Gaza Strip. More than 1,800 Palestinians have been killed, including 400 children, according to the latest figures from the Gazan Health Ministry, while three civilians and 64 soldiers have been killed on the Israeli side at the time of this broadcast. And on Sunday, Israeli shells hit yet another UN school, killing 10 people among the 3,000 or so displaced taking refuge there. This marks the third UN shelter hit in the last 10 days, prompting the State Department to issue a rare statement of condemnation against Israel, calling the strike, quote, disgraceful. But just 48 hours earlier, Congress demonstrated its united support of Israel by nearly unanimously approving another $225 million for the country's Iron Dome missile defense system. This approval, despite the fact that the United Nations estimates that more than three quarters of the Palestinians killed in the campaign have been civilians. Now, just in the last couple hours, we're again hearing reports that all sides have agreed to a 72-hour ceasefire, although thus far, every ceasefire has completely failed. And over the weekend, the rising Palestinian death toll incited mass global demonstrations from France to Australia to call for an end to the bloodshed, including tens of thousands right here on the streets of Washington, D.C. So to discuss these developments, I'm joined now by author and activist Norman Finkelstein. Thank you so much for coming on, Norman. My pleasure. So millions of people all around the world protested the war on Gaza over the weekend. You yourself were arrested at a recent rally that you helped organize. Can you break down the circumstances that led to your arrest? I had been watching the massacre in Gaza in front of my computer screen, uh, monitoring the information and also uh, trying to answer a lot of emails I was getting. Uh, and finally, I felt that uh, sitting in front of a computer screen didn't rise to the occasion uh, of the massacre that was unfolding. And so pretty much on the spur of the moment, I decided it was time to get arrested. I put out a call about 12 noon. Uh, actually, I recall exactly what prompted me to make that decision. Uh, I have a colleague at Harvard University named Sarah Roy. Uh, she's the world's leading authority in Gaza's economy. She spent a lot of time there. She also happens to be Jewish. She's the daughter of a survivor of Auschwitz concentration camp. And she had been sending me and many others these emails of the, hor the horrors that were unfolding. And finally, after uh, Israel struck uh, Shifa Hospital, and also the playground near Shifa Hospital, and several more children were killed. She described what happened, and then she wrote at the end, I want to vomit. And that really struck me. Uh, here was a very elegant, cultured, educated, um, Harvard-trained, and also she teaches at Harvard. And she didn't use any fancy words, any rhetorical curlicues. She just said, I want to vomit. And when I saw that, I decided, you know what, I want to vomit also, but short of vomiting, I'm going to get myself arrested. So I put out a call uh, for the next day to meet at 12 o'clock. About 150 people showed up, and 26, 25 others alongside myself, uh, we got arrested in front of the Israeli mission. And Obama has come out saying that it's heartbreaking what's happening in Gaza, but Norman, despite this helpless detachment, he's projecting a new Snowden document reveals that Israeli aggression would not be possible without direct involvement from the NSA working with Israel's intelligence to monitor and target Palestinians. What does the U.S. have to gain by providing intelligence and tactical support to Israel? Well, the fact of the matter is, and everybody should be aware of it, uh, the, the, the new Gaza massacre could not have happened without President Obama. President Obama was the enabler. Each day when he went out on to a news conference or wherever he was speaking and he said, Israel has the right to defend itself. Each day that he said Israel has the right to defend itself, he gave Israel a green light to continue the massacre. As it happened, as Israel escalated its terror bombing in Gaza, targeting one UN shelter after another UN shelter after another UN shelter, the international outcry, in particular from UN officials, even including, amazingly, Ban Ki-moon, finally uh, put Obama in an extremely embarrassing situation. And he discovered, amazingly, after 1,800 people were killed and Gaza was reduced to rubble, 
hospitals were targeted, schools were targeted, mosques were targeted. But suddenly he, he discovered, because of the international outcry, that the, um, uh, Israel was committing atrocities in Gaza. And that was curtains for Netanyahu. He had to end the attack. He had to intend, end the ground invasion. And, and of course, yeah, they, they released that statement of condemnation of, of Israel's bombing of that UN school. But conversely, on Capitol Hill, there was just that unanimous vote to give Israel $225 million more dollars. Even the most progressive members of Congress voted in favor of this, Norman. When it comes to Israel, where does this stranglehold over our politicians come from? Well, I think when they come, uh, first of all, there are uh, multiple sources of U.S. support for Israel. Certainly, there is the issue, the domestic issue, the issue, the domestic issue of the Israel lobby. Uh, but there is also an overall uh, antipathy to what are called radical Islamists or uh, jihadists. And fairly or not, Hamas is assimilated to groups like ISIS. Um, and so it's, they're considered fair game uh, for Israel's, uh, basically Israel's murder. Uh, and also, I think there was a hope on the part of Pre President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry that if Hamas, if an, a military defeat were inflicted on Hamas, that means uh, President Abbas, uh, the Palestinian Authority, would then have a free hand to sign any agreement that the U.S. government proposed uh, Abbas, the Palestinian Authority, are basically collaborators. Not basically, they are collaborators. Uh, they still had the problem of a more militant resistance, namely Hamas. But the hope was is if Israel disabled Hamas, then uh, the Palestinian collaborators, the Palestinian Authority, would then have a free hand to basically surrender to Israel and sign the Kerry pr peace proposal. And of course, uh, right, it, it all kind of stems back that the Hamas election, I mean, according to a 2008 WikiLeaks cable after Hamas was elected, Israel's official policy was to keep Gaza's economy on the brink of collapse and functioning at the lowest level possible, consistent with avoiding a humanitarian crisis. I wanted to get your opinion on why Israel wants to keep Gaza on, uh, from having any chance of economic development and also Nafiz Ahmed's analysis that, that the assault is to take over Gaza's natural gas reserves that could amount to $4 billion. No, Just I your, don't think yeah. that. No, I don't think, not, you know, politics has its own independence or autonomy. Not everything in politics is reducible to economics. That's kind of crude. Uh, the reason the Israel imposed the blockade on Gaza, uh, the heartless, illegal, merciless blockade on Gaza, uh, the, the, the blockade back then in 2006, 7, and 8, it prevented Israel, uh, Palestinians in Gaza from even having chocolate, chips, and baby chicks. I mean, that's the way, that's how ruthless it was. But the purpose was perfectly clear. They wanted to transmit the message to the Gazans that so long as you uh, allow Hamas to stay in office, we're going to make life intolerable, miserable, a slow death for you. So if you want this blockade lifted, you have to one way or another rid yourself of Hamas. And Norman, let's talk about solutions here. You've been a, a vocal opponent of the boycott divestment sanctions movement, which encourages divestment from Israeli corporations. That kind of pressure helped end apartheid in South Africa, and I wanted to get your criticism. No, I think that's a misnomer. I've never been opposed to boycott, divestment, and sanctions with a small b, a small d, and a small s. Long before BDS came along, I was actively involved, for example, in the divestment movement in the various church groups, for example, the Presbyterian Church. Uh, but BDS is not just a tactic. It's not just boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. BDS is a political program. Uh, as they emphasize, they say BDS is not just about boycotting acts. We have a political program. And the political program says it's based in international law, and it calls for ending the occupation, equal rights for Palestinians in Israel, um, and the implementation of the Palestinian right of return. Now, it's true all three of those rights are anchored in international law. But Israel's existence as a state is also anchored in international law. And you can't pick and choose with international law. You can't say, for example, I have the right to walk at the green, but I'm agnostic on the red. If you have a right to walk at the green, 
it's because you have an obligation to stop at the red. But BDS says it takes no position on Israel. Well, if you take no position on Israel, then you're not upholding international law. International law is very clear. Israel is a state under international law. It's a member state of the United Nations. So you have either two choices. One, you can say, I don't give a damn about international law. This is what I demand. Or you can say, as BDS does, we respect international law, and all of our demands are anchored in international law. Well, if you take that position, as I do, and as BDS formally does, then you also have to recognize that Israel is a state under international law. And, and we've just heard of all parties, of course, agreeing to this new ceasefire, but let's talk about lasting peace in the region. You've advocated for a two-state solution in the past. Do you still stand by that, given everything that's happened? I, and do I you expect it to realistically be implemented alongside the Israeli government's uh, policies toward Palestinians? We have about a minute left. I don't advocate anything. It's not my place to advocate. First of all, I'm not a Palestinian. Second of all, I'm not Israeli. And third of all, I live in New York City. I don't live anywhere near the affected regions. I don't advocate anything. What I advocate is, if you say you're anchored in international law, then we have to see what international law says. Number two, anyone who's involved in politics knows that you have to, politics is not about personal preferences. If you ask my personal preference, I would say I don't believe in two states, I don't believe in one state, I happen not to believe in any states. I'm an old-fashioned leftist in that regard. But politics is not about what you prefer, it's not about what I prefer. Politics is about a realistic assessment of the balance of forces in the world. And a realistic assessment of the balance of political Thanks. forces in the world. Thank you, Norman. Uh, we'll Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Abby Martin. Join me tomorrow when I break the set all over again.